gray is the new norm. Mm-hmm. And taking one out of one's comfort zone is also the new norm in order to stay resilient and agile and relevant in these rapidly changing times. My name is Lori Bedke. I'm an educator, a speaker, an author, and an advisor. I am passionate about equipping and encouraging others to grow and thrive in their personal lives and professional careers. This podcast shares the habits and practices of peak performers and top leaders from many walks of life, physicians, senior executives, entrepreneurs, and academics, and from every season, from the seasoned and sage to those emerging leaders and rising rock stars, all who are blazing trails and shining a light for others. Well, hello, and welcome to another episode of the Growth Edge Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Lori Bedke, and I am delighted to be joined today by Christine Spatafor. Christine is a woman who I have met through a national leadership course that we both teach at for multiple years now, and she is remarkable. You are in for such a treat. Christine is a management consultant, a lawyer, a board member, and a speaker, and we're actually going to be visiting with her twice. This is a two-part episode. Uh, Let me tell you just a little bit about her background, and then I'm going to pass the microphone to her to introduce herself. Um, But in her current role, Christine is a management consultant, and she serves on the board of directors for two organizations, a publicly traded company, uh, Boyd Gaming Corporation, and a private organization, New Kindred at Home, where she is chair of the Compliance and Quality Committee. Her background Christine is a graduate of Harvard Law School and the Harvard School of Public Health. She is super busy professionally with just some fascinating opportunities. She's a lecturer in the Visiting Executive Program at Dartmouth's Tuck School of Business. She is a lecturer in four schools at Harvard, Public Health, Business, Law, and uh, the School of Medicine. She is a BBC commentator. She's a former partner at BCG, the Boston Consulting Group. Man, Christine, I need to stop talking and I just need to pass the mic to you and let you fill in the blanks. First and foremost, welcome. Thank you. I'm so delighted to be here, my friend. Um, and I appreciate the the opportunity to share ideas and conversation with you and, and your listeners. To, to your point for the very gracious invitation, I have really taken the longest distance between two points. It has not been a carefully planned journey, but more of an evolution. And that's a question I get from a lot of uh, my mentees and other young women when they ask about, you know, how did you get from being an ICU nurse to managing your own management consulting firm? And the, uh, the, the journey is one, I think, of really identifying interesting opportunities along the way. I would come across opportunities that were, had been completely unknown to me or opportunities that I created for myself and went from basically the bedside uh, to the boardroom with um, a number of stops in the middle, as you mentioned, with uh, law school and the school of public health, and then um, management consulting, and um, again, then my own my own firm. That's so fascinating, and I am incredibly excited to dig in with you because you have multiple areas of expertise uh, that we are going to traverse. For the listener, this first episode today, we're talking about adaptive leadership and what you just described in your adaptive evolution, the way that you have approached your own career in being intentional and then open to the journey is a remarkable lesson for us all. In addition, the way that we can be adaptive in our leadership, in our individual lives, and in the way that we lead organizationally is incredibly important. But then you're going to rejoin us for a second episode to really speak to the important matter of women on board and the barriers that women face in leadership and in the workplace. So let's start at the beginning. Let's talk a little bit about adaptive leadership first, because you teach on this in multiple forums. What caused you to want to explore this topic and teach on it? But then was it maybe um, born of the way that you've been adaptive throughout the course of your career? The course of my career has uh, certainly an element to play 
in this, in, in that just looking across the horizon and how things are changing and how does one stay relevant when uh, environments are changing so rapidly. So no matter which industry in which one works, the environment is more volatile and complex and uncertain and ambiguous. Gray is the new norm. And taking one out of one's comfort zone is also the new norm in order to stay resilient and agile and relevant in these rapidly changing times. So yes, it has to do with my, my own, what I'll call sort of portfolio career or mosaic career along the way, but also what I was seeing with a number of my clients and how their industries were being so disrupted, um, either through mergers and acquisition or through uh, many times technology. So for example, in the entertainment and um, media space, there has been for some time the conversion from film to digital and then dis different distribution channels for the digital. So making movies doesn't look much like it used to in terms of the technology behind it. How does, how does a, a client, how does an industry adapt to that kind of change and what kind of impact then does that have on the employees? who have been with an organization perhaps for a long time and now need to adapt to a new environment. So it's really personal and it's, it's uh, again, from what I was saying with a number of my clients who are dealing with a significant disruption in their, in their organizations and their business. The, the rapidly changing environment I found really requires effective leadership and a different kind of leadership. With all this uncertainty though, one of the questions that I get frequently is, well, how do you even think about identifying the uncertainty? Mm -hmm. when, the, when the landscape is moving so quickly, how do you even start thinking about what might be next? There is an approach that I've used that people have told me they've found helpful. The shorthand of it is STEEP, S-T-E-E-P. The S is for social, the T is technological, the E is economic, the second E is environmental, and the P is political. Looking at that framework and really starting to analyze the effects from the disruptions and, ch and challenges in each of those areas will help one start to identify some of the uncertainties for their business and for their industry. To give one quick example on the technological, the T in STEEP, particularly in healthcare, there is a movement for more big data analyses. And just for other uh, industries in general, the whole cybersecurity issue on political with some of the recent trade deals, we've heard that supply chains have been incredibly disrupted. How does a business and an industry deal with that? And on the environmental piece, for example, what happens if an environmental disaster devastates your ability to provide services? We saw this in Puerto Rico when the hospitals were severely damaged by both earthquakes and hurricanes. Or now we have uh, this a global public health issue with uh, the virus that started in China. How do you get your organization positioned and identify those uncertainties so that you can start being uh, prepared for what will come at some point? Fascinating. And I would say there is terrifically disruptive change occurring everywhere that we look. I hail from the healthcare. And, and academic realms, not too dissimilar from you and the majority of the listeners of this podcast, the same. There's a lot of change and uncertainty that's very commonplace in our organizations and in our industry. Christine, how do you define adaptive leadership? What is it? And what is an adaptive leadership approach that the listener can help to understand, to frame understanding how they could apply some of the things that you're talking about today? I see adaptive leadership as a practical approach, not a theoretical one, a practical one, which I think is really important 
to solving complex systems issues that have no obvious answer. There's no easy answer. Adaptive leadership is best applied when the environment is uncertain. Systems change is needed. Not a little tweak, not a little technological change, but a systems change, such as a new business model. Mm -hmm. And no one group owns the problem. Mm -hmm. So it requires changes in attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors, which is very hard for organizations. That's a culture change. It requires assembling a multidisciplinary team that has the freedom to innovate and fail and have really hard conversations about what the right solution might be. But the failure part is important. That goes to the culture of the organization, as well as giving this team the latitude to experiment. Again, systems change is needed. There's no obvious answer. There needs to be a lot of brainstorming and thinking and experimentation and trying things on to see which solution may fit best. And it's also understanding that there's a time element here. The adaptive leadership approach is harder and longer to implement. So it's not necessarily a quick fix. So in some, it's business not as usual. So because this is substantially a systemic issue within our organizations or within an industry that change is occurring, but our, the infrastructure within which we do business doesn't necessarily conform to where things are going, we hit a lot of turbulence, don't we? And we don't necessarily have, when I look at healthcare organizations, they're not necessarily set up to be agile or nimble or responsive to a lot of these disruptive changes that are coming our way. What does that mean? How does does that intersection of the disruptive change and um, the structure of our, our, our organizations usually occur? Yes, let me give one example. For healthcare organizations, I'm sure it is top of mind for many of them to be thinking about shifting revenue streams. Mm -hmm. And how is the organization going to adapt to that? For example, McKinsey did a study not too long ago where they determined that $36 billion was shifting from inpatient services to more convenient sites of care, such as the clinics you might see in some of the pharmacies, to at-home care, to urgent centers. Um, That has a tremendous impact on the organization and how are those healthcare organizations positioning themselves and being prepared for um, this evolution of shifting revenue. How will they replace revenue? And if if the revenue is going to go down, then what changes need to happen inside their organization? So that means not only, again, are the uh, leaders needing to identify the uncertainty, but as the evolution goes forward in an organization, these adaptive leaders then are also change agents because Mm -hmm. things will be changing inside the, the organization. There is a predictable pattern of behavior related to these system change initiatives. And it's difficult, but and a challenge and achievable for adaptive leaders to stay steady, even when it feels unmanageable. This evolution is not an an easy one. If one envisions basically an upside down bell curve, on the left-hand side, if you think about from the time of the announcement, when um, this initiative will be undertaken, through denial, anger, frustration, you're sort of going down now, the bottom of the the bell curve. Mm -hmm. Um, Personal attacks, one should be prepared for personal attacks. We could do a whole podcast on that worry, if you like, (laughs) um, for change agents. Then coming up the curve to designing solutions and ultimately implementing them. This is a very difficult journey for many of the employees in the organization. One should expect resistance, and that's typically fueled by a fear of loss. It's hard to give up habits and routines and control beliefs, hard to give up the status quo, and for some people, hard to give up power. 
So one should expect this trough effect ultimately then rising up again to when the solution is implemented. Now, a question I get typically is, well, that's fine. This is what we know to expect from announcement through these difficult challenges, ultimately to implementation. How can one manage this? How can a leader help manage this process and help guide employees through it? One of the most effective ways um, I have found is with a detailed communication plan that is developed even before the announcement is made. And the communication plan includes all of the stakeholders that will be touched either internally and externally, whether directly or indirectly touched by the initiative, so that it is a comprehensive list of all of those persons and perhaps other organizations that need to be informed on a regular and frequent basis. And yes, that includes the resistors. It includes the fence sitters. It not only includes the people that will be going along with this, but particularly the people that will be, that will be feeling very challenged by it. Rumors are much more interesting than the truth. <laughs> so to have to be leading the communication so people feel informed, they may not agree, but they will feel informed is one way to help manage this. The second part of this is making sure that the communication doesn't just go one way, but rather that there is a mechanism for two-way communication, a mechanism to get comments back. You know, listen to the crowd. They will tell you what they think will work and what won't work. And that can be extremely helpful, not only in perhaps um, revising the solution a bit, but also really helping leadership understand what is important to their audience on the communication plan and give them more insight on how to be a more effective communicator and respond to the real concerns that people will have. That's terrific. And um, I think we we can overlook some of those really fundamental, hard, but important elements of communication, consistent communication, revisiting, you know, the key core message, and then engaging all constituents, both the people that are your champions and the people that are your resistors, so that you make sure that you know everything that you need to know. In your observation or in your studies, Christine, What are some of the characteristics that make for an adaptive leader or that help individuals to traverse leadership in these disrupted moments or circumstances of change? What does that look like so that the listener can understand whether he or she is already leading in this manner or the ways that they can take stock or inventory of where they can grow and improve or collaborate to be an effective adaptive leader? One of the The overall idea of adaptive leadership, to your point, is adaptive leaders take a holistic view of the organization. They understand and see the interconnectedness of the relationships across the organization, the interdependencies between people, and they have an articulated vision and goal or not, they're not coming up with the solution. This interdisciplinary team is coming up with the solution. But this is what sets adaptive leaders apart. This is what differentiates them from many other people in their organization. They get this systems view, this holistic view. We are all so busy working in our verticals, whether we're in finance or technology or program, you just imagine sort of all these silos from left to right. The holistic view that adaptive leaders take is that they, they cut through all of those on the horizontal. They recognize the connected elements between all of these different functions in order to come up with a systems solution for the organization. So it, the, the interdisciplinary team that they put together is, is part of their skill. 
and they're bringing together people who typically may not always work together. You may have some finance people that are working with program people and they've never worked together before, but coming up with a solution will require the input and the expertise of both. Again, because remember, no one group owns the solution. It's this horizontal view, which um, really sets these adaptive leaders apart. To me, it sounds like that's someone who is pretty humble. They have to be open to being collaborative. They have to be courageous um, because they've got a lot of tough work to take on and they're going to be staring down a giant of whether it's, you know, resistance to the change, the elephant in the room, um, probably a lot of open-mindedness and curiosity to learn. And like you said, that holistic view, that system view of what's complex, but then the ability to bring it to simple, practical steps that they and everyone around them can undertake. Absolutely. And part of the toolbox, if you will, to get this holistic view is adaptive leaders, when they put this team together, this interdisciplinary team, they leverage that talent and that team is empowered. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes depending on the culture of the organization, there may be a little bump on this um, because it may be so different than how an organization might typically operate. But again, when faced with uncertainty and challenges and disruption, this is a helpful way to to move through that. These leaders also create a safe environment for risk-taking, experimentation, and innovation. We mentioned that a little while ago. Um, Failure is rewarded and not punished. Um, And some people say, you know, tolerating failure, um, if you didn't fail enough, you're not trying hard enough. And coming up with an innovative solution to address the disruption, to address the uncertainty, to address the volatility requires this kind of safe space for risk-taking experimentation and innovation. And, And again, I mentioned having the hard conversation, the Adaptive leader is not afraid to, um, as you mentioned, address the elephant in the room. And it's discussing the undiscussable. It's discussing what has been perhaps pushed off to the side. And it's really critical that this be addressed because whatever these issues might be, they will pop up somewhere along the way, if not addressed up front. And that could undermine the success of the initiative. Adaptive leaders also anticipate this change. They respond intelligently, again, staying steady. They identify and seize opportunities. They check their ego at the door. This is not about them. It's about the team and making the team as strong and as effective as possible. That's amazing. So if we're going to close, and I wish I could just talk forever on this because there's so much more, but if we're going to close, what's your call to action to the listener as you want them to be able to go forth and and apply? Um, what are the core strategies um, that adaptive leadership requires? Well, we've covered many of them, but just to um, emphasize a few at, as we close, again, it's mobilizing this multidisciplinary team for systems change when there is no known solution. And then as a practical yet visionary leader, the adaptive leader is always one who's asking what's next. Again, it will differentiate the adaptive leader from many others in their organization. And again, that will help for them build agility, adaptability, and resilience for the organization and for themselves, and particularly to help keep them relevant in these rapidly changing times. Christine, this is so important. And I have to tell you, I think one of the reasons why I'm so drawn to the work that you do in this space and so appreciate listening to you teach on this topic is that it's such a passion spot of my own and really so keenly aligned to the theme of this podcast, which is growth edge. How do we consistently level up as leaders? How do we individually adopt an adaptive leadership mentality where we consistently approach the edge of our capacity 
and the edge of what is known. And we find that ability to unlock new capacity or not just continue to stay where we've been uh, within the kind confines of what our career has taught us. We started this conversation talking about your career journey that has taken you from you know bedside nursing to law school to business consulting to boards. And I'm excited for our next episode to dig into that. But I implore the listener to think about how you can take what Christine has shared with you today and put it to action, nudge it into motion so that you can think about what limitations perhaps um, you've put on yourself or what complacency exists or how where you want to go next in your career is not going to be possible unless you iterate and adapt and find that new capacity. So Christine, thank you so much for sharing on this topic. I am super excited to welcome you back in the near term future to dig into a couple of additional topics. Anything left unsaid? From your perspective, before we close this episode, no, thank thank you again for the uh, for the opportunity, and again to the listeners, just keep asking, what's next? Indeed, before that next episode and that next visit, where can listeners find you if they want to follow you online or learn more about the work that you're doing? Uh, they can follow me on LinkedIn, on Twitter at CJ Spadafore. And also at my website, christinespadafore.com. Terrific. Thank you for your brilliance and your wisdom. Looking forward to our next conversation soon. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the Growth Edge Leadership Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, please subscribe, leave a review, and share with others. Have a great week.